And if, if you can't get along, uh, it must be your fault. It can't be anything in Richardson Hall. It, it can't be the institution. It can't be, you know, the, the disregard for handbooks. It can't be disregard for due process. Whatever you've done is so serious, so serious, that they can't give you due process. It's a, it's a matter of life or death. Uh, we have we have to handle this on the spot. Uh, I was given you know two hours to decide to resign or be fired because I, because what I did in the classroom that morning was that bad. Welcome to another edition of the Watching Adams podcast. I'm Danny Ladoni. Today we're speaking with Dr. Stephen Roberts, a retired professor at Adams State who taught in the Department of History, Anthropology, Philosophy, and Spanish. He mostly focused on areas of U.S. politics and law, and he tells his story today of basically being told he had just two or three hours to decide whether he was going to resign or be terminated after some incidents in the classroom involving disruptive students. Stephen goes on to talk about a number of other issues related to shared governance and those who are in charge at Adams State University and the kinds of decisions that they make. So please tune in for this edition of the Watching Adams podcast with Professor Stephen Roberts. in St. Louis, Missouri. Been interested in politics dating back to when I was a young young boy. Got a degree in political science, went to graduate school, got a, a PhD, and taught at uh, several universities, University of North Alabama, Southern Utah University, Avila University in Kansas City, and then finally Adams State University. Retired summer of 2014 and return back to uh, St. Louis, Missouri. Can you tell me, Stephen, what are your primary areas of interest in your research, what you study? Yeah, my uh, primary, we'll take it from a general down to the specific, uh, American politics. Within that, elections and voting behavior. Within that, specifically, congressional elections and the role of scandals. My dissertation was titled Sex, Money, and Deceit, the Role of Incumbent Scandals in U.S. House and Senate Elections. So I used to always tell people it's the dissertation that keeps on giving because there's never every year there's new, new scandals out there to study and throw into my database. So the data has grown quite, uh, quite heavy. So obviously this is a field that you enjoy studying and presumably you enjoy teaching. Tell me about how you decided to uh, come to Adams State uh, and what your initial impressions were when you started teaching. I was teaching at Avila University. It's a small uh, Catholic university in Kansas City, Missouri, and I really liked it. Uh, I enjoyed Kansas, Kansas City area. It was the first time that I had the opportunity up to that point to actually live in a more metropolitan area where I taught. Uh, Prior to that, I had been in rural Alabama and then rural Utah, uh, and so I really enjoyed it there. But they, like a lot of small private colleges, they're totally tuition-driven, and their enrollments have been going down. We got a new president, and uh, he was a bean counter. I was the political science department, one person, and I was concerned that um, he may shut down poli sci uh, because of the numbers. Uh, So I was proactive, and I went on the market looking for a job, even though I was more than happy where I was, and I would have loved to have stayed there. Adam State offered me a position. I thought, well, I better, I better, you know, there's less chance they're going to close down a public institution in Colorado than, than where I'm at in Kansas City. And sure enough, I check every year, and they haven't replaced me. They've dropped political science to a minor, and they have adjuncts come in and teach the intro course. So I don't know what if they would have gotten rid of me or shut down poli or not, but I think I made the right uh, decision by uh, moving on. Well, maybe um, you can draw some measure of comfort in knowing that you were irreplaceable. All right. 
I hadn't thought about that. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. sure. So you started uh, teaching at Adams State in 2007, is that correct? Yes, 2007. Uh, what were some of your initial impressions, both in the classroom and in your dealings with your department? The Adams State students initially struck me as, uh, you know, pretty much the same as I had in, in Utah or Alabama, lower income, many, you know, a high percentage of first generation students, which I was. I was the first person in my family to get a college degree, let alone a PhD. Uh, I was impressed with the department, uh, even though there were only two political scientists, uh, but we were in with history, three people in history and uh, philosophy and anthropology. So it was a a department of good people, well, good researchers, academics. They weren't uh, hadn't given up on research. Uh, slowly over time, however, I'm sorry to say that um, the, the students. I've never been around students who were less inquisitive, who who had less of a, a world view, who really wanted to learn. It was very hard to open their eyes, very hard to get them interested in anything, have ambitions in life. I don't think there's anything genetic or anything. I think it was just a matter that the area is just very closed, very family oriented. So I became somewhat disappointed. I think part of that was also the institution that almost every year was lowering standards rather than pushing students. It, w it was just amazing to me how unprepared for college many of them were and just how little Adam State challenged them. Uh, just very di very disappointing. In, in the seven years that I was there, I had one suit to uh, happen again in my first year there, which was his last year there. He was a senior, and he went on to uh, law school at the University of Texas, but he was admitted to a number of uh, good institutions back east uh, and, and northeast, and most even of the political science majors uh, basically, you know, they wanted to stay in Colorado. They didn't want to move more than 200 miles away from home so they could be close to their parents. In seven years, I really had one student that I would put in that category. I have many nice, not good students, nice students, good people, but they just didn't have that fire in the belly. They, they didn't have that ambition. It's like over uh, something that had, it had been stunted. It's the millennials who have been spoiled by their parents and spoiled by society. It's universities and colleges that have taken on the business model uh, that they're not students, they're consumers, and we want to make consumers happy. Uh, we're not going to make them happy if we challenge them too much. Professors aren't supported. You know, if you get some mommy or daddy who complains to the dean or the president or something uh, about the professor, uh, I can't think of one time where I really think the administration uh, would back a, fa a faculty. So let's get uh, into that a little bit. Can you recall specific instances where you didn't feel the institution supported you as a professor, whether it was teaching or in other regards? Many involving teaching, and that came fairly early on. It's like walking on eggshells, walking through a minefield. You never know what's going to happen that day, and you have absolutely no trust whatsoever that your administration is going to support you. I had numerous incidents like that, and they didn't fail. They, they didn't support me or other faculty I heard of. Yeah, um, you know, we've had a lot of conversation on campus recently about shared governance and what the role of shared governance is. Any examples you'd like to cite that stick out in your mind as a time that you thought that you would be uh, backed or supported by your institution, whether that's your department chair, whether that was someone else? Maybe you could talk about that. Yeah, I had, um, and these would be uh, upper level political science students. I had two, a male and a female, who were close friends, and they were in the front row of my class uh, on several days, but one day in particular, I remember, and right in the front row, 10 feet away from me, turned facing each other, carrying on a conversation while I was trying, I think it was a, I think it was a class on elections and voting behavior. So my passion, you know, I'm really passionate up there. I'm really, really getting into the data and surveys and polls and uh, 
everything, and they were carrying on a conversation. And I, I, you know, I, I, I told them to stop. This is numerous times that you've done this, and they just looked at me like, you know, what's going on? And gave me, gave me rather what I consider to be disrespectful comments, with denying that they were talking. You know, when you know people who were sitting behind them in class were making faces at them for being too disruptive. And so I, I, you know, I really, I raised my voice and I said, no, I gave them my, we're here to learn speech. And if, you know, I don't require your attendance, but if you do come to class, you'll be respectful. Uh, you're gonna listen to me and um, this and that. Well, I thought it was over. And um, turns out that one of the uh, students, her mother back in Tennessee called the institution uh, talked to the president, complained about me. I got called into my chair, Dr. Crowther's office, and was told about uh, the incident and that uh, I had uh, perhaps an anger management issue and I needed to have a meeting with him to talk about how I could have handled the situation differently. The students were never called in and told, now on your part, uh, this is the way universities go. Nothing. I had to. I had to explain why I didn't like students talking in my class, and that it was my problem for raising my voice and being too hard on the students. Uh, it was one of those things where I didn't have, really have a choice. It wasn't, you know, would you like to? collaborate and see how you could have handled it differently. It's, you know, I, the writing was clearly on the wall. I wasn't being supported uh, because a mother had called the institution and apparently uh, she's a contributor. She gives money to the school. And it was, it was pretty clear to me that I was the one who was being hung out to dry. I mean, that's one example and one of the earliest examples that really led me to, to see that, uh, wow, I taught for two years at a Catholic institution, and I had more freedom in the classroom than I had at a public institution in Colorado. So I can only imagine, you know, I've, I think we've all had students who speak out um, or talking in class or texting in class or something like that, and I certainly would right. be hesitant if uh, by raising that as a point of you know, attention, and we all as professors have our own style of doing that, but it doesn't sound like you, you know, verbally accosted the student in an unduly harsh way or something like that. Is that true? They thought I was exceptionally harsh. Uh, several of the members of the class that afternoon, and students talked to me outside thanking me, thanking me for finally shutting those two up. So, you know, I don't, I don't think I was, but I, I guess in some people's views, perhaps I was. I do have a deep voice, and uh, there are certain things, you know, if I, if I wanted to teach middle school, I would have done that. I wanted to teach at the college level, the university level, and deal with adults, not pampered, little, spoiled, rotten kids whose mommy and daddy would helicopter in whenever their child got in some sort of trouble. You know, coaches can yell at kids, cuss at kids, football players, basketball players, they're students. They're student slash athletes. If a faculty member talked to a student the way coaches can talk to students to get away with it, you know, it, it's just amazing. It's another way that athletics are given a prominent position in Adam State. Uh, but that's a that's a national problem, not unique to Adam State University. I mean, well, that's uh, certainly a good anyway, point that you bring up, Stephen. That that faculty have a different set of expectations in terms of conduct. And, you know, of course not every coach is going to yell and scream and cuss at their at their athletes, but certainly what we imagine a professor is allowed to do in the classroom and what a coach is allowed to do on the field is is different there. Let me sort of go on. During the latter part of your time there, can you talk about the um, the decision to retire from Adam State or, you know, the circumstances surrounding you leaving the institution? My health was slowly declining. Uh, I, n I never did feel as good there because of the altitude, and like I said, I'm a smoker, and after a lot of years of smoking, you know, it takes a, it takes a toll on you. 
but the the key factor that that led to uh, acad- you know just academically professionally thinking I just don't want to do this anymore. Uh, I had involved students, uh, a student who was being disrespectful in class. It was uh, an intro course. It's uh, you know history going all the way back to Mesopotamia. And I had a football player, a nice guy, and we used to talk a lot. You know, we we would talk football and everything before class. Uh, but he was that day uh, disrupting. I thought class and being argumentative, and I just I wanted to get back to the lecture because we have a lot of ground to cover. We just don't have time to make it a, a discussion. Just to be clear, he wasn't arguing with you about the topic, which I imagine you would encourage, but about something else. Yeah, uh, it was. Uh, if I recall, it was it was either a, a, I think it was Plato, and talking about Plato's uh, some of his ideas expressed in the in the Republic, his major work. And he was just like, well, that's ridiculous, you know, uh, just on his own, loud enough for the whole class to hear. And I said, you know, I, I don't care if you agree with him or not. I want to, you know, I just want you to understand what he believed and why he believed it. Well, that's a ridiculous idea. And this went on for like a minute. And finally I said, you know, look, we're not going to debate this. We're not going to argue this. You know, I'm the professor. You're the student. You need to learn this. What you ultimately do with it, you can discard it. You don't have to agree with it. You can hate Plato. You can never read the entire book if you don't want to. You know, that's up to you. I'm not trying to get you to agree or disagree, but, you know, you're not going to run this class. And eventually he did shut up and we went on with class, and I thought it was over. Well, that happened on a uh, Thursday, uh, and so I would usually get off campus right afterwards. I would go straight to my car and leave because it had gotten to the point that I just didn't even want to be around uh, campus anymore for a variety of reasons, largely, you know, my department chair and other people who just, uh, I just didn't enjoy being around them anymore. And I got a call in the afternoon, it was from department chair Crowder, and he said, did you have a, a situation in your class this morning with a student? And I said, oh, well, yeah. And I explained it to him pretty much the way I just explained it to you, and he said, well, I don't know if I can save you this time, Stephen. I said, well, save me? What do you mean? And he said, well, the administration is really bothered. I'll do what I can. He always made it he always wanted to make himself sound like he's the knight and on the white horse coming in and saving someone's job. And if it wasn't for me, you wouldn't be getting this or that. And so anyway, he called me back later and he said I was to meet with him and uh, the vice president for academic affairs, Frank Novotny, the next morning at 9 o'clock in his office. So at 9 o'clock the next morning, I'm, I'm there. I had to wait a few minutes, and finally Ed comes without Frank Novotny. We go in his office. He doesn't say anything other than, you know, all the years at Adam State, no one's had more complaints against them than you. And he was looking at something on his computer. Got an email from Frank. He wants you to sign a piece of paper saying that I was resigning effectively December the 17th. And I said, for what? What, what what did I do that's grounds for termination? <laughs> I mean, this is somewhat stunning to me because I think most professors have had a situation with students talking in class. We've had a situation yeah. with students who, you know, may not be interested in the material. It sounds like this student was a little bit more objectionable to, of all things, Plato's Republic than one might imagine. Um, I don't have anything right. against Plato, so I'm a little bit surprised that he would take that strong. I mean, he just doesn't sound like he wanted to be in that class. He didn't want to be studying Plato. And I can relate. I mean, we're not all excited about any particular subject. But it, to think that that kind of a circumstance would lead to you being asked to resign, that's pretty stunning. It's stunning, isn't it? Well, imagine how I felt. And by now it's 9.20, 9.25. I said, Ed, I have a class at 10 o'clock. You're hitting me with this at, at 9.25. I said, I, I can't make this this decision. I'm going to be in class from 10 to 10.50. Uh, I, I said, I can't do it. All right. So I left. Stunned. Uh, shell-shocked. Uh, backstabbed. Uh, like, what the heck? It, it, it's 
almost like I was a persona non grata. I just wanted to be to leave. I told him, I, you know, I'm not resigning. Well, later, I'm sitting outside of uh, McDaniel Hall at those little picnic tables they have on the south side of the building. Mm -hmm. And I was talking with um, Joel Karngut. For listeners here, Joel's role is really to handle complaints about um, discrimination, about equity and right. fairness, to make sure that everyone feels that, that their situation is handled fairly in the workplace. Uh, good guy, too. Just a really uh, good guy. And we were talking. I, you know, I told him about it. Well, Ed comes walking up the sidewalk. He says, um, uh, are you doing anything after your 1 o'clock class? two o'clock. I said, no. I said, all right, we'll have a meeting. Come to my office. Frank will be there. This was the same day now. This was a couple hours after he had his meeting and my meeting. So I asked Joel uh, to come. I, I, would you come not as an advocate? I'm not asking you to be an advocate or anything, but I, I, I want a witness. I want someone there who will fairly and accurately and truthfully be a witness as to what is said. Because I, I didn't know that. I didn't have a lot of time. It was getting close to 1 o'clock. I had a class coming up. And I wasn't going to walk the halls. You know, hey, will you come be a witness? I'm in trouble with the administration. You know, so I asked Joel. He agreed to come. We're in there with... I was in there in Ed's office. Tracy Rogers from HR was there. Joel was there. And eventually uh, Frank came in with a piece of paper in his hand. He looked at the paper and basically said, once again, Dr. Roberts, you have the essence of it. Was once again, I had been disrespectful uh, to a student and the university simply wasn't going to tolerate it any longer. Uh, I had until, I believe it was noon Monday. He would give me until noon Monday to resign. Otherwise, I would be terminated. What you've just described, if that is in fact the totality of the circumstances, um, is, is pretty is pretty stunning, um, and anyone who teaches in higher ed would be alarmed to learn that, that those experiences uh, have been cause for your, uh, you know, a demand for your resignation. Um, can you think of, and was there in your personnel file that was shown to you or not shown to you, anything that rises to the level of, of professional misconduct or anything that could be you know, construed as, as really being grounds for termination? Because what you've described just does not seem to be that. Over the years, I probably had two areas where, where I, maybe I did get more than the average complaints. I, I would sometimes be harsh with students who were talking in class or acting up in class or texting in class or whatever. And the other uh, complaint would be that my language, that sometimes I use too much profanity. So were you were you just in your in your speaking you would use a curse word as kind of invective or were these more pointed comments where you were actually invoking you know racist slurs or things of that nature? Okay, yeah. Uh, usually, like uh, when I taught constitutional law, there was a case with Cohen versus California, and he had on the back of his jacket the words "fuck the draft." This was during the Vietnam War. Uh, he was given a citation. The case went to the Supreme Court. The Supreme Court had to decide whether the words fuck the draft were protected speech or not. And so I would use the word fuck five or six times because that was what the case was about. I can relate, Stephen. In, in classes I've taught the uh, the seven dirty words that George Carlin would use in his stand-up. And there's no way to teach that without showing the clip and without using the words. So that was part of the class. Exactly. Right. I was pretty much a you love him or you hate him. My teaching evaluations every semester were amongst the highest in the department. But I was the kind of professor that, you know, a number of people loved me and took courses with me even as electives outside their major. But other people, other students, I just wasn't their cup of tea. Wow. Okay, so let's go back to this meeting. You're there with Ed, with Tracy, with Frank. There's a piece of paper. You have until Monday at noon to resign? Frank left. I didn't have a chance to ask him any questions, uh, but I could ask 
uh, Tracy, but she was only there to talk about uh, benefits if I left, uh, Cobra, and all of that. You know, she would not answer any questions as far as what did I do? What am I being alleged to have done? What is the student saying about me? Why are you taking these draconian actions of threatening termination? This is quite astounding. So, so there was there was no appeals process. There was no independent review that you could use to challenge these allegations. They weren't giving me any. Now, if you read the handbook, there is a, there is a process for a professor if they want to fire them that they have to go through, but they weren't doing that with me. Uh, process was not important uh, to Frank or to Tracy Rogers. Uh, Dr. Savaldi was out of town, I believe. He was out of town somewhere, so he wasn't even on campus. So yeah, that's the way my weekend was. I had, a, by noon on Monday, I had to decide whether I was going to resign uh, or be fired. And to be clear, they didn't and, present uh, you with specific quotes that you could either confirm or deny. There was no opportunity for you no. to respond to allegations. No. Okay, so what happened in the weeks and months to follow? I told Ed uh, that I wasn't going to uh, resign, uh, and I was going to appeal it to uh, President Savaldi. You're describing an appeals process, but you were never told there's an appeals process. You were, You never... No had the opportunity to appeal, you sort of uh, took it upon yourself to do that. Um, right. And in your case, that did have ultimately a favorable outcome, it sounds like. Uh, he came back the next week. He met with me. He was actually sympathetic. Uh, he made a comment that process was uh, some people, uh, not naming anyone, uh, but I read into it to mean Frank Navani, don't always follow the, the handbook and due process. President Savaldi said, you're not going to be fired. I do want you to enroll in a course online or a learning, uh, not even anger management, just learning how to deal with students who might be disruptive. So that's all President Savaldi wanted from me. He basically bitch slapped Frank Novotny and Ed Crowther and Tracy Rogers for trying to pressure me into uh, resigning. You were a tenured professor, is that correct? Uh, yes. Yes. The point of tenure is really to give faculty due process uh, prior to termination, and that that due process includes, you know, a defense of their academic freedom and their, their right to speak and publish, etc. So you had tenure, and it was perhaps for that reason, if not just because it was the right thing to do, that Savaldi intervened to say, we're not firing you. And, and to their credit, a number of students went to Dr. Savoli's office uh, supporting me and wrote uh, lengthy reviews of me as a teacher, as an advisor, as a, as a mentor. I told my, I, I told my upper level I didn't bring it up in class, but those who knew me and would come outside and have a cigarette with me or talk to me, uh, sure, I told them. I wasn't in no obligation not to tell them that the administration was out to screw me over. Do you think you could take a minute or two to talk about why, from your perspective, basically as a, as a career professor, you've taught at many schools, you've uh, worked in a variety of, uh, of types of institutions, why tenure matters to you? Why tenure is an important concept to defend? Well, tenure protects faculty from mischievous administrators and members of the board who, for whatever reason, it could be political reasons, it's a conservative area and you have an extremely liberal uh, professor, let's say, or you have a professor who, due to the internal dynamics, the internal politics of the institution, is being critical of the institution. But without tenure, it's real easy to just get rid of people who don't quite fit in, who aren't playing ball with the administration. And so tenure is a way of protecting faculty from administrations that are not open to um, academic freedom, freedom of the professor to choose to teach his or her class the way that they want, to, to freedom to choose the textbooks that they want. Uh, otherwise, it's all coming down from above. It's all coming down from the administration. And in the long run, I don't think most people would want that.
Why would a student care about tenure? What benefits do a tenured professor offer to a student? Well, a good student, a student who really wants to learn and be prepared for graduate school, law school, med school, or just be prepared to, to go out into the private sector and to work. It would seem to me that students should care that those professors are giving 100% and that you're going to have diverse faculty. Some are going to be more theatrical in the classroom. Some are a little bit less theatrical. Some tend to be more liberal, some more conservative. Some come from different regions, different parts of the country or the world. And so the students getting a good mix. The institutions like this, this play of pluralism, this play of different people who have different backgrounds, different values, and ultimately the beneficiary of that are the students. And without that, uh, they would be being taught by paper cutter images, uh, approved by the board, approved by the administration. Everyone's afraid to go out on a limb. Everyone's afraid to be any different. Uh, it would be a true dystopian novel. I mean, if you were trying to imagine uh, the worst possible society, you would probably have in your book uh, administrative control uh, that wouldn't be tenure. You would be reviewed year by year. And agents of the government, which is what administrators are, they're acting on behalf of the state and have the power. Why would you want that if you were trying to create a totalitarian uh, society? because that's the way that you can clamp down on thought. That's the way that you can make sure that people aren't exposed to ideas that you don't want them to be exposed to. So it sounds like you were uh, able to complete the semester, but that you really only stayed another semester or so before you decided to leave? That's where the health issue kicked in. Um, I taught the May semester and uh, June summer school, and... Uh, I have a bad back. I've had a bad back for years. I, mean, I, I pretty much had to use oxygen uh, constantly. My breathing was so bad that I really couldn't even leave to go grocery shopping or do anything. Uh, so it was basically just really in bad health. Uh, I couldn't see teaching under those conditions. Uh, and I'm sure it was all made worse by the experience I had had with Frank and Tracy Rogers, and so I decided in early August, as the semester got closer, uh, that I just couldn't do it because I, I, I didn't want to be a professor that was calling in once or twice every week. I can't come in and teach my class. I, I took too much pride in teaching. I took too much pride in what I did uh, to do that. So you basically so retired, retired for medical reasons? Yes, because I don't think if I, if I didn't have the medical problems, uh, despite the way I was treated, I, I wouldn't have retired because I love teaching. Uh, teaching was my life. So, yeah, there was medical reasons that I retired. You know, I left and President Sabaldi was still the president. So I, I don't know the new regime, but I, I do have this view of Alamosa and Adam State that it's, they're, they're stuck in a time lapse. Uh, and you can change the players, you can change the nameplates, you can change the faces, but things are pretty much going to stay the same because it's, it's just they're so resistant to change and they have an authoritarian attitude out there. You see it with uh, administration, you see it, uh, I think, generally with a few exceptions in department chairs who are more levels of administration rather than uh, promote faculty. That was certainly the case in my case. That, you know, Ed Crowder, was, he would suck up to the administration and see which way the wind blows, and that's the way he's going to go. Frank gave himself away to me when I went out for the interview. When I went out for the interview in 2007, uh, I had a half an hour with Frank, and usually this is the time for the the provost or vice president for academic affairs to, to try to find out about the candidate and uh, to sell the institution, right? And somehow he got off on the, uh, the faculty and the, uh, many schools are getting away from tenure, he said, and I would like to see us get away from tenure. I think faculty should have had, be evaluated on a year-to-year -year basis. And I was thinking to myself, why are you telling me this? This certainly isn't recruiting me to accept a job if it's offered. Yeah, it's almost uh, like he's can, saying that he wants to come by your office once a week and beat you with a steel rod, and that that's what, right, you know. Right, and, and, and 
and Tracy Rogers was, as I understand it, she went to school there, then she went up north to law school, I guess, at University of Colorado. She moved back to Alamosa. She was practicing law, uh, and she got a call from the university that they had an open. I don't think they even did a search. Just one of those insider jobs. Uh, she'd be good here. That's how she got her job. And Ed Crowther, I mean, it's, it's, it's amazing to me that, uh, you know, I read that he got a DUI as recently as April. Uh, they're going to fire me for yelling at a student in class for being disruptive. But the chair of a department can have 16 points for running through a stoplight, drinking and driving under the influence, uh, supposedly a role model to students and someone who's supposed to earn the respect of his faculty, uh, he should have been, you know, maybe tell him if he doesn't clean up his act, he's going to be in the unemployment line rather than somebody who did the horrible thing I did, which was yell at a student for disrupting class. And uh, it, it was just, yeah, the three of them and probably the others uh, over there that I'm not that familiar with in uh, Richardson Hall. But I think Frank, uh, Tracy, and Ed, they, they socialize with each other. They're always together over there. And that was my experience, and from what I've heard from other faculty, people I respected, uh, David Mazel from the English department, uh, like I said, Joel Carnegie, other people, uh, they know what's up. They know what's up with, with uh, those individuals. Well, so um, any advice you would give, because, you know, this, uh, watching Adams gets uh, hundreds, sometimes thousands of views a day. Um, what would you say as advice or uh, upon reflection for anyone listening, maybe even in Adams State administration, to, to improve the situation at Adams State? Uh, fire the president, uh, who probably has no business being in academia. Uh, I, I don't think anyone should be a president of an institution who wasn't a professor in the classroom, who, who didn't start out with that, and then later they chose to go into administration. Uh, it sounds to me like uh, she's just an authoritarian who has no clue of what a university is supposed to be about. Uh, in her mind, she probably thinks she's running it like a business. Uh, that's, you know, and it's, it's, and it's not a business. Universities and education are not a business. Uh, faculty have rights. Students have rights. Uh, she's bringing the institution into ill repute. I mean, what happened to me, other than, you know, students, few students who knew about it, most people didn't know. You didn't know, did you? I mean, no, I mean, the whole. Know. The point of this podcast series is to really bring about some of the uh, the truths behind the speculation. Of course, everyone has rumors as to why Professor Roberts left Adam State, and I certainly heard those rumors, but I was much more interested in, in hearing from you. With you, it's, it's out in the open what, what they are doing to you, and her attitude, and her behavior, which borders on a on a bizarre, I mean, I, I wonder if there isn't some clinical, medical, uh, mental issues going on there or something, because I, I just, uh, it's, it's just brazen. So, okay, so uh, your recommendation certainly is to, uh, is to fire the current president. Uh, what else would you say would need to be done to make Adam State a better place? Uh, fortunately, Frank, for whatever reason, he's out of that position. Uh, back in the classroom, uh, I think Tracy Rogers uh, needs to find other employment. She sees her role much larger than the Director of Human Resources should uh, see their role. I think Ed Crowther should be demoted. I think they need to have a much more progressive attitude and bring people in who have much more progressive attitudes in their search. But then, you know, who hires the president? That's the, the board. Mm -hmm. And the board is composed largely of people who are authoritarians themselves and don't want change. Uh, I mean, I, I can't believe how resistant the community, the campus community and the larger community are to change. One issue I used to bring up, and I, I see it now here in St. Louis, people say, where did you teach? Adam State College, where's that? It could be in Maine, it could be in Louisiana, it could be in Oregon. People outside of Southern Colorado 
have no idea where Adam State, and, and, I, and, I, and I would say that we need to change the name to something like Southern Colorado State University, or is it so, South Central Colorado State University, and so if you're applying to law school or for a job or something in Pennsylvania, they'll know where you went to college, right? Oh no, that would be disrespectful to Billy Adams, that would be this. I mean, they are so indignant and disrespectful of change. I've never had a non-athlete say, well, I came to Adam State because they've got a football team. I've had football players say I came here because they offered me a scholarship, but I've never had like a regular student non-athlete say I came here because of the basketball team or the football team or because we all all of these sports. Uh, and yet the administration will say that uh, you know, uh, athletics drive the university. Uh, that's, you know, without athletics, Adam State would have to close down because nobody would go to school there. Uh, well, maybe they wouldn't, but it's not because they don't have sports. Adam State is known as a place where it's an easy degree. That is the reputation the place has. Sorry. You know, I mean, I know one professor in my department who gives open book exams and then students can rewrite the exam over and over and over again until they get the grade they want. Yeah. It's hard to call a place a university when these sorts of things go on. I think it's also the case that if you leave, there will be trash talk about you, uh, rumors. That's our rumors floating around about you, you know. Uh, why did Roberts leave? Well, he did this. Well, he did that. Uh, they can't make themselves look bad. They have to make the faculty member looked bad. I mean, you know, look, I, I sort of wonder if I can just riff with you for a minute. Um, if Adam State uh -huh. takes on some of the elements of an occult, you know, because within the cult, everyone has to have a certain perspective and a certain consensus view. And if you choose to leave the cult or if you're ostracized, then everyone has to shun you and your very existence has to be kind of vilified or denied because what you have to say is no longer welcome to the, the leaders of the cult. You're an apostate. Yes. You should be beheaded. I recommend you go back and look at um, de Tocqueville's comment, you know, on it. Comments on America uh, when he visited in the early part of the 19th century and reported back to France on this new country. And he says, uh, um, America has written into their constitution freedom of speech legally. Anyone can think anything they want and say anything they want. But in reality, all that means is the government's not going to throw you in jail for saying things that are unpopular. You have the freedom to say it, to think outside the box. But if you do, your neighbors won't speak to you. Your children will lose their playmate friends. You won't have any friends left yourself. You'll be shunned. You'll be ostracized. So there's, there's this illusion of free speech. But in reality, majority tyranny can be even worse than governmental tyranny because it affects you 24-7. And so I think you're right when you refer to it as, a, as, a, as like a cult, a religious cult. Uh, an ideological cult, and if, if you can't get along, uh, it must be your fault. It can't be anything in Richardson Hall. It, it can't be the institution. It can't be, you know, the, the disregard for handbooks. It can't be disregard for due process. Whatever you've done is so serious, so serious, that they can't give you due process. It's a, it's a matter of life or death. Uh, we have we have to handle this on the spot. Uh, I was given you know two hours to decide to resign or be fired because I, because what I did in the classroom that morning was that bad. So I'm I'm sure that since I've gone that you know all sorts of things have been said about me, they need to learn that they can't continue to disrespect faculty, to abuse faculty, to exploit faculty. Radical change needs to take place, and apparently hiring a new president, uh, who I have no experience with, but I'm sure had I stayed, I would be. You know, it's the first sign that I, you know, I am who I am. I don't think she would have been a big uh, believer in Roberts, uh, so I might be right out there with you. Uh, but you know, neither. I don't think she was any surprise. I, you know, why did the why was she the board's choice? Did they not? Do any vetting? Did they, they not 
not find out about her. Uh, I know somebody who's familiar with New Mexico, and they said that she had a reputation in New Mexico for being an authoritarian, not my language, but their language, an authoritarian bitch. I think that's probably what the board wanted. I think David Savaldi was basically a decent man. I may not have agreed with everything that he always decided, but that's part of life. But I did not see him as an abusive, intolerant, authoritarian. If anything, he was too democratic, small d, democratic. And I think, you know, just bad timing uh, that they the, that he left because I don't think you would be experiencing what you're experiencing with Dr. Savoli. I, I know he was a breath of fresh air and he saved my job over the vultures of Crowder, Novotny, and Rogers. I think probably it would have been quite different for you. Uh, I'm sorry if I sound extremely negative um, and harsh, but I call it the way I see it. I have no criticism of the students there other than they, they so many lack imagination there's some good faculty there. It's mostly administration and the board, I think, that's dragging the place down. So, you know, if I, if I came across a little bit harsh and negative, you know, I've got bad experiences with the way I was treated. But there are good professors there. There are some professors who will do anything for students, work hard with students. They do it every day. They're underpaid. They're underappreciated. Adams State is way below national averages, regional averages. Compare Adams State to sister institutions, and we pale by comparison. Uh, and people still, you know, go to work every day, faculty, uh, busting their butts. So I want to give them their, their due. My one hope, faculty need to become assertive. Shared governance was, and it sounds like it continues to be, just empty words at Adams State. And it's going to stay that way until faculty basically get the balls to stand up, have a vote of no confidence, go on record that this new president is hurting the institution, bad publicity. It's certainly not going to help recruit students. It's certainly not going to help keep students there. It's not going to be good to keep faculty there. Uh, if I were a graduate student, ABD, or finished my PhD, and I heard about AM State, they offered me a job, I might not take it. I, I'll take my chances on getting another job somewhere. Faculty need to become more assertive, more aggressive, and stand up united for themselves. So I know that takes a lot of balls because, you know, you could be persona non grata. It's going to take a lot of people who are willing to stand up and fight and risk things. But if, if there's nothing worth fighting for in life, then what is life all about? Great. Well, thank you so much for joining us, Stephen. It was great to have you on this episode of the Watching Adams podcast. Thank you, and best of luck, best wishes for you, Daniel. Mm -hmm.